excuse me if I clear my voice or throat a few times. I'm a little bit hoarse uh, this evening from having a bit of laryngitis, but we'll see what, uh, what the Lord will do. Uh, I'd like to uh, read for you John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21, and I want us to pay particular attention to verses 15 and 21, as well as our meditation to see that basically the points that we're going to have in this uh, sermon. But let's uh, first of all read the text beginning in uh, verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. <clears throat> I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. And again, let me just remind you of the uh, meditation. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. May the Lord uh, again bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, this morning, <clears throat> we were reminded that uh, Jesus did not come to free us from obedience but rather to free us from disobedience. He obeyed His Father's law, not only that we might actually make it into heaven, but that we might also obey His law following His example. Now, we saw that also the more we obey it and encourage others uh, to do the same thing, the more we're going to reflect His image, that is, the image of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the greater we are going to be in His kingdom because we're going to be doing more of what it is He made us to do, what He saved us to do, what it is He wants us to do. This evening, I'd like to follow up on this theme with three things that I hope will encourage us to grow more in our obedience. And as we grow in our obedience, obviously, we're going to grow in our usefulness to the Lord. Uh, the more we actually submit to what the Lord calls us to do, the more uh, He can use us in His kingdom, and the more glory we'll give to Him, as well as, of course, gain reward for ourselves. Now, the three things I want us to look at are, are these. <clears throat> First, if you love Jesus, He says, you will obey Him. Obviously, there's a relationship between those two things. Secondly, if you love Him and obey Him, you can know that you are also loved by Him and by His Father. Actually, if, um, if we don't obey the Lord, we really can't know that. And then finally, the more you obey Him, the more these things will be true of you. That is, the more you obey the Lord, the more you uh, submit to Him, uh, the more the Father will love you the more that Jesus will love you. Again, we're, we're beginning to see that um, the Lord, there, there are things we can do to draw His heart out towards us. He may love all of us, but He doesn't love all of us the same. He, he does have, as it, as it were in Scripture, His favorites, but His favorites are those who are more devoted to Him, who love Him more and are more committed to Him. So there is a relationship between how much we love Him and obey Him and how much we are actually loved by the Lord. And we see that in our text this evening. Now, first of all, we see the relationship between our love for the Lord and our obedience to Him. You might say that our obedience is a measure of our love. I mean, consider what he says in these passages. In verse 15, he says, "'If you love me, you will keep my commandments.'" And then in verse 15, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Now, I, I think 
we, need, we do need to see how this relationship works because for one thing, we know that it is possible to keep His commandments and really not to love Him at all. We want to make sure that we're not mistaking this. It's not just enough to keep the commandments to prove that we love Him because we, know it's all, we all know it's possible to go through the motions to keep up appearances for a variety of reasons either because we want others to think well of us, we want them to think that we are believers, that we really do love the Lord, or maybe because uh, some, some outside force is sort of compelling us to do this, uh, some authority if, for your children, maybe your parents. You know, again, our children here really aren't going to know exactly how deep their commitment is until they're out on their own and don't have parents uh, standing over them telling them that this is what they need to do. Sometimes just that authority can cause us to obey when we really don't love the Lord. Sometimes the Spirit of God can do this as He works convicting us and convincing us of the truth of these things. And what will happen to those who don't obey the Lord, we might actually obey Him out of fear rather than out of love. So it is possible uh, to love the or I should say, to obey the Lord without loving Him. Well, Jesus isn't telling us that just any kind of obedience will prove that we love Him. I mean, Paul tells us that it's possible even to make uh, great sacrifices without love. A person might give up all their possessions to, uh, to feed the poor or even make the ultimate sacrifice and lay down their life and yet not have love. And if, it, if there is no love in it, as we know from what Paul says, it means nothing to God. So Jesus isn't necessarily saying here that if we obey the Lord, we necessarily love Him, but what He is saying is if we love Him, we will obey Him. It's impossible to love Jesus Christ and not to do what He tells us to do, at least at some level. Again, there are varying degrees of that. But there is, there is really no such thing as one who is truly connected to the life of Christ, who is truly in Him, who has His Spirit in Him, that doesn't obey Him at some level. I mean, think about this. Uh, if, if you love the Lord, if, if you've been, basically, if your heart has been moved by what He has done for you, and He's done quite a bit through His sacrifice for you, that He was willing in order to save you to actually become one with you. That's something we can't even comprehend. Uh, the one who is the Creator who made uh, all these creatures would be willing to become one of those creatures. And as we saw in the, um, the new members class as we considered his, you know, his, his condescension, that He not only became uh, in the likeness of men, but He became in the likeness of sinful men. And that he took upon himself the role of a servant, and not just to serve his people, but ultimately to die for us, uh, even that cursed death on a cross. Everything that Jesus did, he did for you and for me if we are trusting him. His life, his death, his resurrection, even his ascension and his intercession. Certainly, if you understand the value of that, that will move your heart to love him. Certainly, His character should do that for you as well, I mean, because this is a display of what we would call infinite love, that the Son of God would be willing to do this. And certainly, it reveals something of His perfections, something of His holy character that He would. And of course, if you have been moved by the Spirit of God within your heart, because that's why Jesus came into the world after all to cleanse us of our sins so the Spirit of God could again dwell in us. If He has changed your nature by His Holy Spirit so that your heart goes out to God with all these things in view, how can you say you love the Lord for His sacrifice, for His character, and you actually have that principle of love in you and yet not obey Him? We, we basically will because, uh, not just because of who He is and what He has done, but by the Spirit of God alone. He's changed our nature so that we, we automatically go out to Him, as it were. We, we love Him so much, we, we have to yield to Him because that's what we want to do. So again, if you love the Lord, 
Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, secondly, if you love Jesus so that you obey him, you can also know that he loves you and that his Father loves you as well. Jesus says in verse 21 of, of John 14, He who loves me will be loved by my Father. Actually, the Bible tells us that if we love Jesus Christ, it tells us not that we will be loved by Him. I mean, certainly that is true, but that we have always been loved by Him. I think we've already heard something about that this evening. Uh, that, you know, the fact that our hearts have been changed to love the Lord is the evidence that the Father loves you because you can only love Jesus by the grace which God gives to you. Uh, that is one particular point that uh, we're... Uh, going to look at in the new members class and something we believe to be true in this church, in this denomination, is that we only love Him because He first loved us. We can only love Him because He has changed our hearts to do that. So the fact that we love the Lord Jesus Christ and are trusting in Him and obeying Him is the evidence that the Father loves us. I mean, God only gives His grace to those whom He first loves. And of course, he only chooses to bring to his son those whom he has uh, loved from all eternity. Uh, Paul tells us something in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30, which I'm sure you're very familiar with by now, and something we'll get to also in, in the class, that tells us something of the connection between God's foreloving us and the fact that we are trusting in Jesus and what will happen to us as well in the future. He says this, <clears throat> For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, those of you who have heard, heard well, me teach on this before, you, you've heard me say that there is a connection between the foreknowing and the glorification. Actually, as you move from one category to the next, all move from one to the next. In other words, all who are foreknown are predestined, all who are predestined are called, all who are called are justified, all who are justified are glorified, which means all that are foreknown actually reach glorification, and that means in heaven. They reach the goal. So what does it mean to be foreknown? Well, it means to be foreloved. There's a couple of different senses in which the Bible uses the word to know someone or to know. I mean, it, it refers to uh, knowing some facts, you know, about somebody. You can know someone in that sense. But it also refers to relation, relationship. For instance, those of you who have the King James Version of the Bible, if you were to read Genesis 4.1, it says that Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore a son. So what does it mean by that, that um, Adam came up and got to know Eve and that caused her to conceive? Obviously not. But that he had an intimate relationship with her that brought about this conception. Knowing isn't just referring to knowing something about someone or knowing something to be true. Neither does foreknowing mean to know something ahead of time before it happens. I mean, God knows everything in advance. He foreknows everything in that sense. But it refers to a love that the Lord has placed upon certain individuals. Foreknowing them means He foreloves them. So basically, if the Lord has given to you His, His grace, if He has called you, so that now you love and obey the Son of God, it's because He has foreloved you. Again, as I mentioned before, John writes, we love because He first loved us. So we cannot love the Son unless the Father first loves us. So when we love the Son and obey the Son, it is the evidence that He has loved us from all eternity, that God has loved us, the Father has loved us. And of course, we also know that if He has loved you, if He has loved me from all eternity, uh, by the fact that He now loves us, that He will always 
love us. Again, something else that we believe to be true, which is very important, um, uh, well, to our assurance that we are going to make it to heaven, is to know that if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ because God has foreloved us, that same love that moved us to do that is going to keep us in Christ and, and bring us to glory, as I mentioned before in, in the passage we read in Paul. Those whom he foreknew or foreloved, he also brought to glorification. So if he has loved us in eternity by the evidence that he loves us now, then we will always be loved by him. And of course, Paul spells that out more clearly at the end of Romans chapter 8 where he says this, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how can you know that the Father has loved you from all eternity? How can you know He loves you now? And how can you know He always will love you? Well, you can deduce this from the fact that you love and obey Jesus Christ. And that's really the only way you can know. Now, if you love and obey Jesus, you can know not only that the Father loves you, but you can also know that Jesus loves you. Look at again at verse, four, well, verse 21 of John 14. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. He who loves me, he says, I will love him. And then he says in verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Now, this, I believe, is referring to Jesus Christ from this, the perspective of His humanity. Again, in, in His human nature, He doesn't know absolutely everything. He doesn't have divine knowledge. He has that in His divine nature, but not in His human nature. So how does the Lord Jesus Christ know that the Father loves you? Well, it's because of your love for Him. That is the evidence that the Father loves Him. And Jesus knows that if you are loved by the Father, then He knows there's something special about you. And that specialness is the fact that the Father actually sent Him into the world to lay down His life for you. Jesus knows that you are a part of His bride when He sees you obeying Him. He knows that you are someone that He is going to actually have to love for all eternity. And so as Jesus understands that about you because He sees your love towards Him, He sees your obedience, He knows then that the Father has loved you and chosen you to give to Him, He will love you in return. And the Bible says He will reveal Himself to you. Now, I don't think that means that Jesus is going to come down bodily and say, here I am, you know, you know now I'm, I'm going to love you. But it does mean that He's going to reveal Himself to you spiritually. And I think what that means is that He will make sure that you know that He loves you. I think that's subjective. It's something we will experience in our hearts, that sense that the Lord loves us in return. And I think that most likely comes through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, who is like an internal witness of the Father's love. In Romans 8 again, see, all these things tend to be coming out of Romans 8, uh, Paul writes this, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, how does He do that? I think He does it by way of convincing us that the Father loves us. And perhaps one of the ways he does that is by pointing to the various evidences in our lives that we do love him. And one of those, of course, is our obedience. But I think, again, it's a sense that we are loved by God. He testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. 
So your obedience is the evidence that you love Jesus Christ, but it's also the evidence that He loves you and that the Father loves you. Now finally, uh, we need to see that the measure of our love is also going to reflect the measure of that we, ex well, that we know that Jesus loves us and the Father loves us because the more we love them, the more we will be loved by them. Uh, I, well, again, the connection between the two is one is the measure of the other. It's not the same for everyone. And I think Jesus is perhaps the best example that we have of this because who has loved the Father more than Him? and who has been loved by the Father more than Him. Now, why did, um, you know, why did Jesus obey His Father? Well, He did it for the same reason that we do, and that is because He loved His Father. We see in chapter 15, verse 10, again, one of our texts this evening, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Jesus obeyed His Father because of His love for Him. Now, we know that's not the only reason why Jesus obeyed the Father. It's true that Jesus also loved us, and He obeyed to save us because He knew there would be a people that His Father would give to Him. Whether Jesus knew them all individually as a human being in this world and recognized them everywhere He saw them, we don't know. But certainly when they trusted Him and loved Him, He knew them just as we've already seen. But Jesus came into the world, as I've said, because He loved us, but primarily because He loved His Father. And He wanted to do something for His Father. He wanted to do what it is the Father sent Him into the world to do, which is to repair His honor, which had been, um, well, He had been dishonored through the sins of mankind. And He came into the world to satisfy His justice so that the Father could basically, uh, well, I, I want to use the word consummate, as it were, His love for those whom He foreknew. He could consummate His love for what we call the elect. As long as our sins clung to us, as long as we were guilty, the Father really could not love us in the way that He wanted to love us because there was nothing in us that He really could love. That's one of the reasons why we say when God chooses, it has nothing to do with, with us and everything to do with Him because all He sees in us when He looks at us outside of Jesus Christ is sin. That's all we have. But when we are in Jesus Christ, He can love us and He can love us basically because there's something that is beautiful about us now. We are clothed with Christ and our sins are taken away. We actually are lovely in Him. Well, Jesus was willing to come into this world because He loved the Father enough to do the work that was necessary in order to take away our sins and to make us something the Father could love. Jesus was willing even in doing this to become sin. For us. Now, it doesn't mean that he became sinful, of course not, but he became guilty for us. He took our sins upon himself, became a curse for us, and died in our place. That's what Paul means when he writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was willing to take our guilt, even though He was innocent, to take our guilt upon Himself and to die in our place so that the Father could have us because Jesus loved His Father. Now, I think that above everything else shows us just how intensely Jesus loved Him. His obedience was the measure of His love for His Father, what He was willing to sacrifice in order to show His love to Him. And we have several statements of our Lord Jesus Christ with regard to what He was all about, what was in His heart, what He came into the world to do. He said to His disciples when He was in Samaria, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. He said on another occasion, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him 
who sent me. And then in his high priestly prayer, he prays this, Lord, or Father, I glorified you on the earth, <clears throat> having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, this was the heart of Jesus. This is how intensely he loved his Father, how he was set on doing his Father's will. And this is also why the Father loved him so much. Because Jesus bore his holy image and because Jesus desired to do his holy will with all his heart. And you know what? The Father was not remiss in expressing that to the Son while he was in this world. When he was baptized, the heavens were open. The Father declared from heaven, you are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. He said the same thing on the Mount of Transfiguration. His entire life was one of devotion to the Father because his heart was entirely his, which is why the Father, when he says, I am well pleased in you, he basically say, is saying, I am delighted with you. You are everything that I love. Now, the point I'm making here is simply this, <clears throat> that yes, it's true that if you love Jesus, you will obey him. And if you love Jesus and obey him, you are loved by the Father and you're loved by Jesus. But it's also true the more you love him, the more you will obey him. And the more you obey him, the more he's going to love you. Just as Jesus loved and obeyed the Father more and was loved more, we might say, of course, the most. Your obedience is the measure of your love for the Father and the Son. And your obedience also is the measure of the Father and the Son's love for you. Now, again, it is true that in a certain sense, His love for all of us is infinite. It reaches down to an infinite level, as it were, pulls us out of the pit and makes us fit for heaven. That's infinite love. But somehow in the midst of that, there are differing levels with which the Lord favors His people. And it's based a lot upon their heart for Him, which is expressed in our obedience to Him. Now, if all of this is true, then the question we need to ask is this, how can we love Him more? so that we can obey Him more, so that we can be favored and loved more. Well, I think you know that there are several ways we can do that. I'm just going to mention briefly the ones that we're most familiar with. There are the means of grace. Use them diligently. There is also the warning not to quench and grieve the Holy Spirit through compromise, because the more you compromise and grieve the Spirit, the more you're going to be compromised in your ability to obey the Lord and love Him because you're going to have less of the Spirit. You use the means of grace to get more of His influence, but then you lose it all by compromising, by sinning. So you gain that grace and you hold on to it. So use, and this, this is basically what we need to do, use the means to gain His work and then walk carefully so you don't lose that work. You know, there's sort of like a, a vicious circle if we grieve the Spirit and we lose that love, then we have less ability to keep from grieving the Spirit. It's sort of like a downward decline. But there's also a virtuous circle, which when we use the means of grace and hold on to that grace that He gives to us, then we have a greater ability to love the Lord and to obey Him, which means less grieving of the Spirit and, and as it were, preserving that influence. Another way that we can, I think, love the Lord more is not to forget to meditate on what it is that He has done for us and for our salvation, what the Father has done, what the Son has done, what the Spirit has done. This is one of the, I think, advantages of um, understanding the Bible as we do and seeing what it is the Lord actually says about His foreloving us from all eternity. Meditate on the fact that He has. The only reason why you love Him, the only reason why you've trusted Him is because He has first loved you. Meditate on that everlasting love, on His choosing you from before the foundation of the world to make you His own child and to bring you into His family, to send His Son whom He loves so much to die for you. 
And of course, to send His Spirit to take what the Son has done and to apply that to you. The Father has done all that. That should move your heart to love Him more. Not to mention, of course, the fact that He is infinitely perfect. And He is infinitely holy. And having a changed heart by the Spirit and seeing that should move your heart towards Him. Think about what Jesus has done. That He was willing to come that He was willing to become one with us, one with you, become one of the human race and to obey and to suffer and to die and to do, to die in, in, well, as we've seen, the cursed death of the cross as a criminal, to be raised again, to ascend into heaven, to rule over you, to basically subdue your heart to Himself by His Spirit and to continually intercede for you in heaven all that you might eventually arrive in heaven. And think about what the Spirit has done, that He is willing to come and apply Christ to you, to put you in Christ, and then to dwell in you as a principle of life, as an active principle of love. And then, of course, don't forget to meditate again on how much they must love you to have been willing to do this when You are still an undeserving sinner. Remember how Paul argues if if God was willing to send His Son into the world while we are still His enemies, how much more will He keep you now that you are His friends, now that you are His sons and daughters in the Lord Jesus Christ? That is the measure of His love. Now, if you use the means of grace, keep from uh, grieving the Spirit of God by compromising, by allowing yourself to sin, and you meditate on who the Lord is and what He has done in each facet of the work of redemption, it should cause your love to grow. And as your love grows, you will obey Him more. And the more you obey Him, the more He will love you, the more He will look upon you with favor because you will be honoring Him more with your life and advancing His kingdom in His cause in this world. Well, may the Lord help us to do that because that's why He redeemed us. That's why He created us. That's really what this whole thing was about is that He might be glorified. We need to learn to set ourselves aside in our love for the Lord and to follow the example that our Lord Jesus Christ gave us. He did these things, remember, not just because He was setting out to save us, And, of course, He did them primarily because of His love for the Father, that His Father might consummate His love upon us and that He might give us to His Son. But Jesus also did this as an example for us to follow. And His example was, I have not come down to do my own will, but I have come to do the will of my Father. That was the measure of His love for His Father. And that's the kind of love that He wants each of us to have for Him. So look at your life and see how much you're obeying the Lord, how much you're seeking to glorify Him in the things that you do. Again, we're not to be part-time Christians, but full-time Christians. Everything we do is to be done for His glory. Is that what you're doing? If not, then you are grieving and quenching the Spirit and actually making it more difficult for yourself to love the Lord and to obey Him. Seek to do all that you do for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, Paul says, do all to the glory of God. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice to Him. That is how much you are to love Him. And really, that is our goal. So may the Lord help us by His grace. May He grant to us a greater love. And we might obey Him more. Now again, in a moment, we're going to come to the Lord's table. But let's remember as we look at the table that this is the demonstration of the Lord's love for us. He was willing to love His Father to this degree, to lay down His life for us. He was, he was willing to love us to this degree. The Lord says, this is the example we are to follow. We are to lay down our lives for Him. We are to pick up our crosses and follow Him. So let's, uh, let's pray for a few moments and let's ask that the Lord would help us to do that, help us to grow in our love that we might follow His example.